everybody to another episode of Trans Regret Snoopy Presents the Bible. I have a very special guest with me today. I have Josh Patterson from Rethinking Faith here to speak with me about John 1. Welcome, Josh. Hey, how's it going? I'm well. How are you? I am good. I had a nice relaxing day and so I'm all rested up. Very excited to be here. So ready to dig into the word. Straight up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and how faith plays a part in your life? Yeah, sure. So um, my name is Josh, like you said. I co-host a podcast called Rethinking Faith with one of my best friends, Marty. Um, I am a former pastor. I was a pastor for six years. Um, I did a variety of roles uh, during that time. So I was a youth pastor. I was a young adult pastor. I was a teaching pastor. Um, in three different churches. And recently, I mean, super recently, so within two months, uh, I decided for my own mental health and a variety of other reasons that I needed to take a break from vocational ministry, um, at least for this season in my life. So I resigned my position as high school and young adult pastor at the church that I was at um, and became a bartender at a local brewery uh, here in, in Maryland, where I'm from. And actually today they just announced that, um, I've been promoted. So I'm now the general manager of a local brewery here in Maryland. And so, uh, I went from being a pastor to being the general manager of a brewery. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but I think it's so cool. And without trying to sound too shocking, I don't mean it that way. Um, I have experienced, grace and peace and acceptance and invitation and the presence of Jesus in the brewery on way more occasions and with way more frequency uh, than I did during my time in the church. And that's not a slight against the church. That's not me saying Jesus isn't there. I've just found Jesus in very unique ways. That's really interesting. That's, um, I think that like uh, you had to have felt at one point a calling to want to be a pastor, right? To to oh, want to devote definitely. yourself in that way. But 100%. Like we know, um, anyone that has spent any time in prayer or uh, reading the Bible or um, engaging with faith in any way, um, the will of God is complicated. <laughs> very uh, much so, to say the least. <laughs> uh, it can be very challenging to feel the presence of God. Uh, and I think that oftentimes what we may not know to be it is the the very voice of God speaking to us and telling us where to go and 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 how to how to live how to be and and what to do with ourselves there are a lot of options and i'm glad that you found one that has made you happier yeah most definitely it's been exciting it's been a it's been a journey and um yeah i don't know i'm just excited to be along for the ride pretty much. <laughs> That's kind of my my position and posture at this current point in my life. Well, we discussed um, a little bit before we decided on this particular passage, what we might talk about, and we landed on John 1. What drove you towards thinking that that was a good choice? Yeah, sure. So if I could have chosen anything, I would have picked the Sermon on the Mount, but I know you've already <laughs> done stuff about that. And so I was like, okay, well, I can't do that. And plus that maybe that's like a cop-out answer or something, although I think it's great. Um, and so then I was trying to think like, okay, what passages are fun or you know, what's something that I could be a nerd about? And then I shifted that and I was like, okay, what about Instead of asking like a mental, like in my mind, nerd question, what can Josh be a nerd about? I said, let me try to shift this from my head into my heart and say, okay, where's my heart leading me in this conversation? And I felt like John 1 was the place that I wanted to go. Um, Just because the way that John talks about God, about Jesus, um, is a way that I 
relate to experientially more than just mentally in my mind, if that makes sense. No, that does. Um, that's that's really interesting because I've yeah. heard I've heard a lot of people say, you know, I, I prefer this gospel or I prefer this gospel. And in a way, I kind of hear people saying like, it's not that I prefer this Jesus or that Jesus, but I prefer the way that that they that particular writer presents Jesus. Yeah, like how they how they bring out certain aspects of his personality and his life, his teaching, and um, and in this case, um, John takes some sort of artistic um, direction uh, from earlier books in the Bible, and so this particular chapter is really really cool because you see it calling back directly to Genesis, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is so cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's crazy. And like John just has like a very high Christology, like John's understanding of who Jesus was is like really, really big. And that <laughs> excites me. Um, and he almost like, instead of having like a birth narrative, he has like this really big, like, cosmological understanding of who Jesus was. And it's just, I don't know. It's very exciting to me. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did my last episode on a different um, chapter in the Gospel oh, cool. of John. Um, and in that one, I read a little bit of the introduction to that book uh, from the voice translation of the Bible. In this case, I want to read a little bit from the uh, NRSV introduction and um, just to give everyone a little bit of uh, a recap, I should say, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe that's not exactly the right word. But uh, in the Oxford NR NRSV, it says, the fourth gospel explains the mystery of the person of Jesus, like others uh, among his contemporaries, yet also unlike them, he stands above them in unique, solitary grandeur. Whence this uniqueness? I love how British this one is. The <laughs> The evangelist takes us behind the scenes of Jesus's ministry, giving us a glimpse into his eternal origin and divine nature. He was unique because he was in the beginning with God, active in creation, the source of light and life. Hence, when he became incarnate in human flesh, he made known the eternal God whom no one has ever seen. As we do with the other evangelists, the author records real events, but he goes beyond them in interpreting these events. He uses symbolically a number of terms drawn from common experience, like bread, water, light, life, word, shepherd, door, way, to make the significance of Christ both clear and gripping. After a magnificent prologue in chapters 1, 1 through 18, he sets forth Jesus Christ as the object of faith in chapters 1, 19 through 4, 54, depicts Christ's conflict with unbelievers in chapters 5 through 12, his fellowship with believers in chapters 13 through 17, his death and resurrection in chapters 18 through 20, and concludes with an epilogue. A uh, little bit more here. A large part of the gospel consists of discourses of Jesus. These discourses are not individual sayings, as in the synoptic gospels, nor even collections of sayings, as in the Sermon on the Mount. They develop a particular theme. Uh, furthermore, it is characteristic of the Johannine discourses that Jesus is interpreted by questions or objections from the hearers, something that never happens in the other Gospels. So, as long and as wordy as that was, I think what the introduction is trying to set apart here is that the way that John talks about Jesus is very different. Mm -hmm. And the image of Jesus that he's presenting, while the miracles are the same or the, the, um, the story may be the same, uh, the presentation is very different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very much so different. And that's one of the things that I'm so drawn to um, about this particular, you know, about John as a whole, but about the the opening, you know, the, the prologue 1 through 18 um, as a whole. So I kind of, um, my f faith tradition background, whatever language you would like to, to put to it, um, has some very Anabaptish uh, roots, which stems from the Radical Reformation. And so they were very Jesus-centered. And so basically during the Reformation, when everyone was like, sola scriptura, you know, scripture alone, um, the Anabaptists were like, well, wait a minute, let's take it a step further and say Jesus alone. Jesus is the center of our faith. And uh, I think John just kind of nails that. 
And so I think that's one of the things that also sets John apart as well is the centrality um, of Jesus. I mean, it's, you know, and his, his, all of his theologizing and whatnot. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's clear and we'll dive in in a second here because it speaks for itself really, but I think it is clear that um, John, it's, it's not that all of the writers of the gospels didn't elevate Jesus as God, didn't acknowledge his place as God, but John seems to have a special kind of level of um, admiration and respect and, uh, and almost um, acknowledging more the eternity of Christ rather Mm -hmm. than just the, um, the life of Christ. Yeah, that's really well, well said. So I usually read from the ESV. What's your preferred translation? Uh, the ESV is definitely a go-to for sure, that and the NRSV. But then if I'm specifically hanging out in the New Testament, I like, um, so N.T. Wright is like my favorite Bible scholar and theologian. So I have his translation, the Kingdom oh, wow. the Kingdom New Testament. Yeah, I, I go there a lot. I want to hear, um, yeah, I want to hear a little bit of that. If we can okay. pepper that in, because I, I tend to bounce between translations a little bit, because I find that I'm puzzled frequently. Uh, not just because I haven't been to seminary and I'm not like a theologian and I, I'm like not that formally educated on this stuff, but I find that anytime I get puzzled by a particular passage, it always helps me every single time to have a new one to jump to and say, okay, sure. well, it doesn't necessarily mean that what I come up with from these three or four translations that I read is going to be correct, but at least then I understand it a little bit better. Yeah, right on. So... um Jumping right in. The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And I don't want to stop too many times, but I feel like we already have to stop, don't we? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) John's already wilding out. (laughs) So the Word, which is in in the Greek logos, Uh, of God is more than speech. It is God in action creating. This is what the NRSV says in the footnote. Um, The word is uh, in capital letters. The word is in this case, I think referring specifically to Jesus being with God and being in God and being God while the world was being created. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite things about this opening here. Just that, so that's where Jesus gets really, really big. Or one mm-hmm. of the parts, you know, because um, oftentimes growing up for me, um, I was always told that when we talked about the word of God, we were talking specifically about the Bible. But here, John is making a different claim. When he's talking about the word of God, he's saying, wait a minute, Jesus, that guy is the <laughs> word of God. <laughs> yeah, it's all Jesus. Like, yeah, uh, if you even if you're considering the Bible to be the word of God, it's all Jesus. Start to finish. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's so cool. And he goes on uh, in verse three, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. I don't love the phrasing in the SV there. (laughs) uh, In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So Mm. here we have a picture of the creation of the world. And Jesus is right there. Um, I think sometimes it can be easy to lose Jesus in the early parts of the Old Testament. Oh, very um, much so, yeah. Es- especially in um, like Deuteronomy and Leviticus and these like very l- legal kind of um, bits of scripture that are specifically like, this is a rule and here is how you live and this is how you're supposed to do this. And, um, you know, don't cut your hair or don't trim your beard or whatever it may be. Um, and because of the way that Jesus comes off in the New Testament as someone who kind of is like a come as you are type of dude, uh, it can it can be easy to lose him in those earlier um, in those earlier books. But it's important to remember that part of the Christian faith being this sort of triune God, the the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all being one part of God, like that means that Jesus was there too. Um, that does open some questions about like theologically about like open and relational stuff and and what did Jesus learn and what got what did God learn and and how did they change over the course of of the Bible? But um, how do you feel about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. That's I, I'm so happy you said open and relational. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. So for me, like, what's so crazy about what's going on here is like, I would, I personally, and again, this isn't going to be everyone within the Christian faith. So this is me. Um, I would try to draw a distinction between uh, Christ. Not the title, but like say logos, for example, if I equate that with the word Christ um, and the person of Jesus. So for me, like this opening bit is talking about in the beginning was the Christ. You know, the Christ was close beside God and the Christ was God. In the beginning, he was close beside God. Um, and so for me, the the affirmation that uh, when we say Jesus Christ, like for me, that's making two claims. It's saying that in the beginning was this the Christ, whatever this mystery was, that you know all things were made in, in and through the Christ, and somehow Jesus, the person, is an incarnation of whatever that Christ mystery is, and so it's again, it's like making Jesus this really big thing because somehow the the foundation of everything, the the I don't even have words for it, like the the thing that was present in and through all things since mm-hmm. forever, the animating life force behind everything. Uh, the Christ has always existed. Like you were saying the the Trinity and somehow Jesus like incarnates or is, Jesus is somehow a very special representation of what this Christ mystery is in human form. So for me, it's like amp, like, like builds up or makes special what it means to be human because the creator of everything, the, d- the divine presence, the force behind in and through all things, uh, cared enough about humanity to become incarnated in the person of Jesus. So the Christ has existed forever. Jesus has existed for 2000 some years. And now the Christ exists in the person of Jesus forever. So it's like, like, what is this stuff? This is crazy. Like, being a Christian's insane. Like, this is crazy, but so cool. <laughs> yeah, I think um, taking it, like, way back to the, um, the like, baseline level of Christian education, when someone's yeah. saying Jesus Christ, they're not saying first name Jesus, last name Christ, right? It's Jesus, <laughs> right. Jesus comma Christ. Like, you know, uh, S, like, you put Esquire at the end of someone's name. It's a title. The Christ mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. Uh, a figure that was believed to be, like, this, th- this, this, powerful figure that was part of God that would be coming to earth. And this is yeah. why the Jews were were so adamant about how Jesus should be acting or how Jesus should be behaving, uh, what Jesus' ministry should be doing on earth, because they believed this Christ. They, they knew that Christ was coming. They just didn't think it would be Jesus. They right. didn't think he was going <laughs> to act that way. Uh, yeah. They certainly didn't think he would be so open to allowing Gentiles and and tax collectors and prostitutes and anybody else in his in uh, to join you know to to forsake their old life and to join the ministry because those people were unclean right Samaritans were unclean it's like uh, Jesus su- surprised people from the moment he stepped into human form because he was so open because he was so loving and he was humble. Um, Part of the reason that I think, I mean, based on the interpretation that I have of, of the entire story of Jesus, they killed him because they didn't think that he was doing it right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even that they didn't necessarily think that he was the Messiah. They just thought that the Messiah should be taking down the, you know, the empire. That yeah. that uh, that they that the Messiah should be propping up the 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 practice of. Judaism, not necessarily like opening up a, a whole new faith to all sorts of new people and a connection with God. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like, I mean, Jesus, uh, <laughs> Jesus made a, a, a ruckus for sure. And, and they ended up <laughs> killing him for it just because, I mean, I think you're exactly right. The radical inclus- uh, inclusive nature of Jesus hanging out with Everybody that all the religious people that day said, hey, you shouldn't do that. And he was like, eh, I don't know. I think I will because that's <laughs> how God is. <laughs> you know, that I mean, they called him a they called him a drunkard for hanging out the drunkard. They called I mean, they called Jesus all sorts of things. Um, and ultimately, yeah, they killed him because he didn't look like the Messiah that they thought he should. Yeah. 
See, we're already here and we're in the fifth verse of this. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's crazy. John um, is awesome. <laughs> I love the way that uh, the voice um, kind of modernizes this particular passage. Uh, it says, before time itself was measured, the voice was speaking. The voice was Ooh. and is God. The celestial word remained ever present with the creator. His speech shaped the entire cosmos, immersed in the practice of creating. All things that exist were birthed in him. His breath filled all things with a living, breathing light, a light that thrives in the depths of darkness, blazes through murky bottoms. It cannot and will not be quenched. Uh, like, I know that from a translational standpoint, <laughs> that's a nightmare. <laughs> sure. But it's so cool. I mean, it it's just so sounds good. so good. Yeah. I'm with you. I, I mean, I'm not one to get overly uh, anxious about like, I mean, I think, you know, solid interpretation is important, but like paraphrase versions of things like that can be so helpful because it just really brings these things to life and like different people think differently or respond differently to different phrases. And so for somebody who like that specific wording gets them excited or lights them up, then I'm like, what's the harm in that? That's that's awesome. It did what it's supposed to do. Yeah, absolutely. Like um, I was reading a devotional the other day that was describing um, – a good a good translation of the Bible as uh, a tool, um, like yeah. it's 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 not just that. I think I think it's important to say it's not just it's not just a tool. It's a lot more than that. But like, if you have a good tool, you will make something, you know, make something that's sturdier. You'll make something that's um, that's uh, that's better. The higher quality mm-hmm. creations come from the higher quality tools. So, um, with that, you know, consider where the information is coming from. And you know who, what translations you know who who is involved in the translations and what that translation does with the source material, but also understand that this is thousands of years of writing that have been pulled uh, over and over and over again through so many different lenses that maybe the best tool is the one that fits in your hand the best. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I like that a lot. That's good. Um, should we jump back into verse six? Sure. Go for it. Uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. John the Baptist is what they're referring <laughs> yes. to here, by the way. I got tripped up by the first time I read through this. Um, I was like, wait, John, you're talking about yourself? That's <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's writing about himself. Hashtag flex. Like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to wait till my dog quiets down here. Before no I- worries. So, yeah, so he's not talking about, this is not John writing about himself. He's a, right. He's talking about John the Baptist. In verse 7, it says, He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Just like to be very, very clear here, John the Baptist like wasn't part of the God. Uh, John the Baptist was a groovy guy who was sent from God to, to get this, um, to get this message out there into the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and the more I read about John the Baptist, the more I like love him. Like the more <laughs> I just think he's like such a cool dude. And I'm sure at the time there was tension between the the, the different kind of groups. Like he had apostles of his own. He had followers of his own yeah. um, that kind of distrusted in a way Jesus or, the, or, or didn't really think that the ministry of Jesus was like, this isn't really the way, like this is not the way it's supposed to go. Oh yeah, um, for sure. There were like tons of uh, like would be messiahs, you know, so to speak. Like these people were common going around, and you know, people with uh, disciples and followers, and um, so for sure, there that was going to cause lots of tension. And then John the Baptist was always like, "Yeah, but this Jesus guy, maybe yeah, he's cool." And, <laughs> and the way that the gospels like kind of make it clear that John the Baptist is like related to Jesus in in some way, I think cut like sort of cousin. Um, yeah, something and like it's, that. The, the language is kind of vague, but like they're basically related, and they met like before they were even born. And so John the Baptist, like, was he was he was down like from day one, but he was also like it. It cracks me up that s- some of the like the Pharisees or some of the people that were like more traditional, um, like more traditionally Jewish, were more apt to believing John the Baptist uh, and in like his oh he's the one that's called. Than Jesus, even though he was like wearing camel hair and eating bugs and honey, and <laughs> like this is not a normal guy. This is like yeah. a very, very weird guy. 
Like he he was like the super crazy extreme like vegan hipster of his day. <laughs> 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 not to bash anybody. My wa- so my wife is a pescatarian, so I'm not making fun of anyone's eating choices. <laughs> Just trying to make a comparison. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, uh, he's a fascinating character and, and the fact that he is cemented as part of the plan of introducing Jesus and, and like launching the ministry of Jesus is important. I think it's important to note that, but yeah, for sure. um, Verse nine says the true light, which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own. And his own people did not receive him. And now it's getting kind of sad, isn't it? Very sad. <laughs> <laughs> like, but I created you. How could you not, how could you not love me? Right. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that bit there always has kind of stood out to me. And like the way that um, Wright phrases it here, he said, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to what was his own and his own people did not accept him. Um, And I feel like within Jesus's context and culture where like a community and like your people, you know, Israel or whatever was so important for your own group, your own tribe, your own whatever language you want to use to like not accept you was already like this really big issue within like this realm of like honor, shame, kind of society, you know, um, being cast so out that, was like the worst of punishments, like being yeah, cast absolutely. out of, of the, of the tribe of the group was, was a, was a massive punishment. It's it devastating. Yeah. Yeah. And here it is the creator and everyone's like, eh, yeah, forget that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously that's like a, that's like the long and short of it. I think it's funny because yeah. <laughs> he, he kind of wraps up the whole like story of the life, but without going into much detail in this first like 11 verses. <laughs> He's trying to give the spark notes version. <laughs> um, I like the use of accept there too, though. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so verse 12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Hmm. So by simply, by accepting Jesus, you become a child of God, I think. I mean, it's not what it's saying here. Yeah, that. so that's like the one verse in this, this passage, uh, passage that has always tripped me out because like there's a part of me that wants to be like, Everybody is a child of God. But then like here and also, I mean, in other places, like Paul kind of makes a similar argument. Like, no, there's like people and like God loves all the people. But then here's what you have to do to become a child of God. And it uses this like heavy adoption language throughout scripture. And I like personally, I have always struggled and wrestled with that. Like, I don't know what to do with that language. It makes me very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, because for me, I want to be able to say like, no, we're all God's children. Yeah. Um, I have, um, like, yeah, if we're all created by God and we're all like all humans are created in the image of God, like what purpose would God have of not allowing certain people into the kingdom or not allowing certain people to be, um, to be a part of the family? Yeah. Um, But it's funny because in uh, John 17, which I talked about last week on the show, there is a, a part in the high priestly prayer that says, all mine are yours and yours are mine and I'm glorified in them. So that kind of says anyone that believes in God also believes in Jesus and is therefore part of the family of Christ or mm. vice versa. Um, but that language obviously gets tripped up if you read literally every other book in the Bible. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a lot more complicated than that, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. And I like... It kind of, for me, like one thing that I at least think about or maybe ponder, um, I'm not saying this is the answer, but at least maybe makes things a little bit more palatable for me. I like wonder, you know, kind of, so I think of the ideas when, you know, Jesus talks about being like the narrow gate, you know, the wide, the road is wide. Um, and like, then like the narrow road, whatever. Um, and I wonder if that's not talking about like this, uh, awakening or understanding of, 
what it means to live life uh, fully in the presence of God. So I wonder if that idea can then be mapped on here. So instead of it being like there's God's children and there's not God's children, I wonder if it could be talked about um, in a way that's like, okay, there are those who have been awakened to the kingdom of God that is present here and now. Uh, there are those who who know that it's here and that, that Christ is in and through all things. And there's those who don't know these things, um, but that doesn't make them lesser. They're just not aware of the kingdom that is right here in front of them yet. Hmm. Um, and I don't, I'm not saying that's an answer, but that's like a, I don't know. I wonder that makes it more palatable for me. And maybe I just need to get over that and not make things more palatable. <laughs> well, you know, it's like, I wrestle with this kind of like universalism thing a lot sure. that I want to believe in my heart that everyone can, everyone will go to heaven. Sure. Uh, I, I hate the idea of hell. I hate the idea that anyone gets, gets um, separated permanently from God. But I think maybe a more scripturally sound interpretation of or, or, or um, belief would be one saying that all can be saved, that sure. no one is locked out. And that perhaps because the language in the Bible does at sometimes contradict itself, like the who can and can't be saved isn't really going to be up to us. Sure. And, and who is allowed, um, you know, into eternity into heaven or who is, um, who should be welcomed into the family of God, like here on earth, isn't maybe being totally accurately understood today. I, I think that a lot of people get um, demonized for who they are. Um, a lot of people get cast out for who they are. Um, and, you know, that bases itself more on parts of these Bibles or parts of the Bible that tend to kind of contradict each other. I mean, yeah, that's a little confusing. Um, what I mean to say is that uh, churches shouldn't, churches should be taking a cue from Jesus uh, and um, opening their doors to everyone. Yeah. Um, let someone let you down first before you say <laughs> that you're not welcome here. Yeah, for sure. I like that phrasing. Yeah, that's awesome. I wonder, um, cause like, I, I totally get that. And I feel like too, like if, as someone who is a proponent of open and relational theology to be, you know, a quote unquote universalist becomes very difficult because then uh, that removes the free will of creatures, you know? Um, like I still want to be able to say that if God offers God self fully to somebody and they, for whatever reason they have, want to reject that love, um, I mean, maybe that's what's going on here too. Maybe there is this idea that there are those who some, for some reason, whatever reason that may be, they will reject the love that God is offering. Um, you know, and so even if the gates are always open, so to speak, maybe God, you know, gives the dignity to humanity to still make that choice, either love me or don't. Um, and everyone's welcome to accept that love. Uh, but maybe God is so loving that uh, those who choose for whatever reason to not reciprocate that love are granted the uh, ability to make that choice and God honors that choice. I don't know. So God didn't damn you, you damned yourself, basically, right? If, if, you're, if you're rejecting, see, but this is, I think, a little troubling to me because I go, okay. at, at what point are you permanently separated then? Does doubt oh, sure. constitute a rejection of God? Because if so, most Christians I know are permanently separated from God. Oh, if they've at any including point this doubted, one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like this is, I, I, I wrestle with it every day. So like, um, it can't simply be that. So how far is too far? What constitutes a permanent rejection? Um, damn, that's complicated, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's very complicated. Yeah, and, and to an extent too, like I wonder to what, so like we, we have this idea of the afterlife, but I wonder to what extent Jesus was talking about um, a type of life, a quality of life that was present in the here and now. Um, and so if, if, if he's offering this relationship, this personal relationship, uh, this connection between uh, us and God without, you know, you don't need the temple, you don't need a priest, like God is everywhere. You can access God right here, right now. 
Um, if Jesus was offering that and it's like, Hey, the kingdom of God entering the kingdom of God is a, is a way of being in the world. It's a, a quality of life in the here and now, not necessarily, or not just something that happens when you die, but rather something that you can engage in the here and now. I wonder what, um, wrinkles that adds to the conversation because then it's not just who's in and who's out, but it's more so like, um, who's entering into this way of being in the here and now. Um, so that, I don't know. That just, it adds like an extra layer. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it totally does. Okay, churches, cool. A lot of churches operate as like a family and yeah. they, they have a support system for each other. I mean, this is like the best thing that churches do on earth. Uh, it, it, the Christian faith is endlessly like generous with people. And, oh, very uh, much so. you know, especially people that, that help each other out financially. And, uh, you know, you can't find a place to live right now. Let me help you. Let me host you. Your car broke down. Let me get, you know, help you get a car. I mean, this is like how God moves, I think, in churches. Um, so like, yeah, I think that's definitely a consideration. I think further complicating that is that like the, uh, the end times, the eschatology of it all is to say that like some people believe that heaven is not going to be there. It's here. Right. That it's going to happen here. And so like what we build here is going to constitute, you know, part of what heaven is. So, so yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. It's um, being part of the family uh, of God, being, um, being a child of God. We can't just imagine that as like who, who like St. Peter checks off the list to, to like let <laughs> through the pearly gates or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh, where did we leave off? <laughs> uh, let's see. I think four. I think fourteen is where we yes. left off. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John, I like that. There's parentheses used in here. There's like very little parenthetical, like little asides in the Bible. Like usually they'll cut it into a new paragraph or something, but. Uh, it says, John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Um, this is, of course, referring to um, when John baptizes Jesus, right? And this guy mm -hmm. opens up and God says, this is my beloved son. And John the Baptist is like, yep, totally. <laughs> Like right. I told you guys. <laughs> I've been trying to tell you for a minute and you guys didn't want to listen. <laughs> um, the idea of like a heavenly ranking is also very funny to me because I'm picturing like, all right, so who's four? <laughs> Don't say the Pope. Do not say the Pope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't know. That is that is really funny to think about. I've never thought about that before. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, verse 16 says, for from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Hmm. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Hold on. That's cool, right? Maybe Moses is, is Moses four then or five? <laughs> five? <laughs> right. Moses is somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah, he's got to be in there because he's saying, um, and so this is like an echoing of, I think, some of the more like conservative uh, beliefs of, no, you have to listen to everything that the Old Testament says, right? Mm, because sure. Moses gave the law and Jesus made the sacrifice. But I don't love that that puts Moses kind of on the same like level as Jesus. Yeah, no, I'm with you. And I think, so like the translation I have in front of me, um, says says it this way, 17. The law, you see, was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus the Messiah. And so, and they have like a, um, oh, a, a colon, dot, and a comma. That's a colon, right? English grammar is Semi, not much. Semicolon. Semicolon, yeah. a semicolon. Yeah. Uh, English grammar is not my strong suit, which is why I did so bad in Spanish. I never got anything better than to see in Spanish class. <laughs> Because I couldn't do the English grammar, so how am I going to do it in Spanish? Anyway, um, so there's the the semicolon. So for me, it's like juxtaposing these things. So you see, you know, the law was given through Moses. Okay, so the law was great. But here's the good news. Grace and truth come through Jesus, the Messiah. So it's like how I see it here for me is like it's actually kind of 
elevating Jesus above Moses. Like you guys thought the law was so great, but grace and truth came through Jesus, the Messiah. Um, because for me, like as, as one who, uh, I really tried to actually fully put Jesus at the center of my faith, of uh, my theology, of how I read the Bible. So, um, I, I want to be able to say that Jesus, you know, if we read the Bible through the lens of Jesus, the words of Jesus have to, if they come into conflict with, say, Moses or Joshua or whoever, Jesus has the final say. And so I think for me, how it's at least written in this translation, the juxtaposition is saying like, okay, so the law was given through Moses and that was good. We don't need to say the law was bad, but... Grace and truth came through Jesus, the Messiah. So it's superseding. So yeah, yeah we had the law and, and yeah, we don't have to totally discount the law, but now we have grace and truth and we have the word. Yeah. Um, that's really cool. Is it, I mean, I don't know, I guess I, I should know more about this if I have a Bible podcast, but uh, what was John writing more maybe for a Jewish audience that maybe understanding what he's saying here as like, yes, we understand like Moses was, was cool. Like he got it. Like he was, he was called. And when he was called, he did everything that he could, but now things have changed. We have a whole new perspective on things. That's really interesting. Cause I think, so I'm trying to look here. I, so I have um, an NRSV in front of me as well but it's like the Jewish annotated New Testament. Oh. So it's like a bunch of Jewish scholars that are like, hey, we're going to read the New Testament and tell you what we think about it. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so I'm trying to see what they say about the audience because I'm not, I, I myself am not actually sure if he was writing to a more Jewish audience or not. Um, but I do think that like some of the language, or I, I know, not just think, that some of the language here in John has actually been used as kind of like uh, anti-Semitic, um, which is really dangerous. You know, we don't want to do that. We don't want to pull Jesus out of his Jewish context. No, no, absolutely um, not. I mean, Jesus was devout. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, like straight up. <laughs> and so um, I know that's a part of it, but I, I actually don't know the answer to that, to to John's audience. Um, that's interesting. That's really yeah. cool. I mean, the the the, um, the voice again at 17 says, you see, Moses gave us rules to live by, but Jesus, the anointed, offers us gifts of grace and truth. So I think it's more like your translation where mm, it says, like, mm-hmm. this is superseding the, the law. Like, um, maybe don't throw it out completely, but think about this. Yeah. He, he's here now. Right. Yeah. And... I, and- <laughs> for me, like language that I try to use. So it's like not, um, like anti-Semitic or, you know, anti Judaism is language of like, Jesus didn't like just ditch the law, but rather perhaps ex- expanded upon it. Or, I mean, the, the language of fulfillment, like let's take biblical language. You know, Jesus says, I didn't come to, um, abolish the law, but rather to fulfill it. And the word in that verse is, um, in the Greek is telos to bring something to its telos, its end goal. And so it's kind of like riding a train. Uh, If you were to get on a train from say Boston to Baltimore where I'm at and, or, you know, whatever the train arriving in Baltimore, when you got off, the train had achieved its telos, its end goal, its end purpose. It served you. It took you from where you need, you know, where you were to where you needed to go. You got off the train and then you didn't say middle finger to the train, you know, forget the train, <laughs> blow up the train. We don't need the train, but it's like, no, the train did the train's job. Yeah. And so we're thankful. We're, we're grateful for the train. Thank you train. Um, but now you're here. And so that's what Telos is. So, so I feel like even here, um, we can kind of have a similar idea. Like it's not that the law sucks or that we should, hate on it or something like that, but rather Jesus brings it to its end goal. It's, it's, it's fulfillment, it's purpose. And now that the law has been fulfilled and the purpose has been fulfilled. Now we have this person of Jesus, the true word of God. Yeah. Does that make sense? That is so cool. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> and this is some of the conclusions I would never come to on my own. Okay. Something I would never cool. understand on my own. So that is so cool. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That, 
um, my buddy Bruxy Cavey, he's a, a pastor up in Canada. Um, he does a lot of talking about like, what does it mean to read the Bible through the lens of Jesus and like actually kind of have teeth to that? Um, cause everybody as a Christian wants to say Jesus is the center of our faith. Um, but that's not always actually the case. And so, uh, Bruxy and people like him, Greg Boyd is another person that's friends with, with Bruxy and this really cool, uh, movement right now called Jesus Collective, um, that I have the privilege of being a part of, like, we're trying to actually take seriously, like, okay, if Jesus is the center of our faith, what does that mean for everything, for how we read the Bible, for theology, et cetera. So, um, and you can't separate Jesus from the context that he was in. Exactly right. Um, there's so much the context. Yeah. There's so much of Christianity today that, um, would love it if Jesus was this outsider who was like, you know, basically like, rewriting the the tablets like he was just scrubbing it all and that's not <laughs> at all what was going on um what he was doing is seeing through uh what was to happen mm -hmm. um and you know living now it's 2021 and we are this this far separated from the death and resurrection of jesus um what to make of that now is another question i mean a lot of the people who um, I was just uh, listening to um, uh, uh, someone talking about Paul and how Paul was like this incredible, um, incredibly brilliant guy who had so much to say, but everyone that was surrounding him, a lot, a lot of people that followed him were thinking like, well, he knows when Jesus is coming back and it's going to be like next week. Yeah. It's going to be like 20 <laughs> years from now, Jesus is coming back. And as time went on and on and on, I think in a way folks started to say, well, we need to, again, reconsider how we read all of these scripts. How, how, how do we take the scripture and say, um, and say, well, now it's 1400 years removed from Jesus's death and resurrection. What do we make of the prophecy now? What do we make of Revelation now, uh, 600 years forward? Uh, we, you know, we live in a time, I think that we might be obsessed with the end times. Like we might be obsessed with the apocalypse <laughs> now. Like every everything, the pandemic, the riots, everything that's happening in the world, while it has massive cultural significance and importance, I think a lot of people want to write this into, yes, oh, this is all part of the, this is all part of Revelation. Um, so it's coming tomorrow. And, and we're just like starting over again. Like, yeah, I know Jesus, he's going to be next week. We want to live as though he will be, you know, coming back. But how do we know? How do we wrestle with that? Yeah. That, I mean, those questions are huge. And like, um, I mean, I think eschatology is just so important. And I mean, even to just to the idea that you brought up, like Paul, um, I mean, I'm of the opinion that like when Paul was saying that Jesus was coming back, like ASAP, I think Paul actually thought that and believed it. Um, which then, you know, you have to wrestle with like, okay, well, it's in the Bible and that didn't happen. So like, is the whole Bible not true? Like, no, not at all. That's not what's happening here. But I think that's that's part of what's so interesting about the Bible is like, it's this beautiful, like book, this, this wisdom book <laughs> that <laughs> like, it's living, right? We use, you know, Christians everywhere use that phrase. It's a, it's the living word of God, the living word of God. And so that has to mean at least, you know, at the very least that the Bible can speak to us still today. Even when Paul in Paul's time was thinking about, oh, well, maybe it's tomorrow. Maybe it's five days from now. I don't know, but it'll be ASAP. Like what wisdom is present within scripture and how can we without sounding like a crazy Pentecostal or something, how can we partner with the Holy Spirit uh, and in communi community with others or like on podcasts like this, where you invite people on and you talk about the Bible? Like, I think that's where the power lies. That's what mm -hmm. is so interesting. That's where the wisdom comes forth. That's where the, the, the Bible becomes alive again, is in these conversations and community and partnering with the Spirit. Um, and I, I don't know, that... I lost my train of thought. And no, I don't know no, it's I, okay. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I agree. I think that like, if we don't know exactly when it will be that, like if there will be an end time in, in the way that we see in Revelation or 
if, um, you know, if it's all going to wrap up at, at a certain point, um, we will never know. At this point, we we won't know until it actually happens. I don't think that oh, there's sure. going to be any any real warning. We've had plagues, okay? We we we've had all we've had everything that could have led us up to this point. So, what we should be doing then is trying to connect with each other to live as Jesus did as much as possible, to live according to the Bible as much as possible. That is what cultivates, I think, the presence of God on earth. And beyond that, it might be out of our hands. And I hate talking about it that way because I, I wish I knew. But you know, so my heresy, here's my heresy of the week. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder sometimes what would have happened if rather than closing the Bible at Revelation, we allowed the writing of um, Christian mystics throughout time who have had prominent real spiritual experiences, who have seen God and felt God, we shouldn't say seeing God because we haven't quite finished this, this passage yet. <laughs> we'll know that no one's seen God, but um, who have had these intense spiritual experiences, what would have happened if we had left this open? What if we, what if we had left the canon open and allowed the, the book to continue to be written over time with those of us who have had like intense spiritual experiences? I mean, there's no way to know, but it, it just blows my mind because it was kind of cut off at a point, but that doesn't mean that people stopped feeling God. That doesn't right. mean that people stopped sensing him. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you. Like God, that doesn't mean God stopped speaking. That didn't, doesn't mean God stopped or people stopped experiencing God. Um, yeah, all of those things. I think with the, the eschatology thing, like I think eschatology is so important, but it's also can be like a double-edged sword. Um because if your eschatology is one that's just like, oh, well, the world sucks and it's just going to get blown up and destroyed <laughs> anyway, so whatever, you know, that that leads to like people don't care about the environment or da-da-da, whatever. Um, but then if you have an eschatology that's like, no, God's going to restore and redeem all of creation, you know, and, and heaven and earth will be restored once again, then like that can, you know, provide a lot of hope and then you can live into that in the here and now, Um but the, the other danger in, in the eschatology is like, I feel at least how I was raised and maybe so many Christians are so concerned about living a life after they die that they forget about living the life that God has gifted them in the here and now. Um, and I think the life in the here and now matters a lot too. And so, oh, hundred like, percent. Yeah, the, the it, catch it there. does like kind of give you this um, this license to look beyond your life, which is crazy because we might only have this life. Very uh, well, we could. might literally <laughs> only have this. And this is my doubt. You know, we're talking about doubt. Sure. Here, here we are. This could be it. And if this is it, and if uh, we're to take the Bible as the best way to live, the way to live the most fully, and to be the happiest then let's do that rather than just looking past um, this life. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's wrap up. Sure. Uh, verse 18 says, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. What do you make of that? Yeah, so for me, here's where I want to put on my like Jesus-centered hat again. <laughs> And say what John is getting at is prior to the person of Jesus, no one had seen God. And I mean, Paul talks this way too. Paul says that, you know, before Jesus, we saw things like through a veil or through like a dimly lit window. Like we didn't quite like, it's not that the people, um, you know, the Old Testament and up, you know, before Jesus, it's not like they didn't have genuine encounters with God. They did. But it wasn't a full revelation. And so for me, this is a place that I go to kind of help build up the argument that, as Hebrew says, Jesus is the ultimate revelation of who God is. If we want to know what God is like, look to the person of Jesus. And so here, I think for me, how I would interpret it is John is picking up that or like talking that way, basically saying, look, no one has seen God until they've seen Jesus. Like Jesus is the full revelation, the, the light, whatever language John likes to use. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of who God is. And so if you want to know what God is like, look at the person of Jesus. 
all these other um, stories that we have, you know, throughout the Old Testament up to Jesus, I'm not saying that they're false or that they're not true or anything like that, um, but they didn't have the full revelation of who God was the way that you and I do on this side, you know, of the the resurrection um, where we know that Jesus is the ultimate revelation of who God is. Yeah, this is this is like where um, the, the ESV really stumbles. And I don't know if it's a limitation of what they were using for, you know, uh, how they were translating the, the source material. The NIV actually, I think, puts this a lot better. Hmm. Um, it says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father has made him known. So hmm. it's not that, uh, no one has ever seen any incarnation of God, but the God, the father of the, of, you know, the triune God, that's who we haven't seen, but we did see God in Jesus. Jesus made himself known, and and through that, we can now know God as a whole in a way that we weren't able to before. Yeah. No, most, most definitely. I, I really like how the NIV, the, uh, NIV puts it there. What does um, N.T. Wright say about it? Yeah, let's see what good old N.T. Wright has to say about it. <laughs> he Like, his wording, when I just looked at it, it was, like, still pretty clunky. And, like, you have to read it in context or else it doesn't make sense for what he's trying to say. But he says, Nobody has ever seen God, the only begotten God, who is intimately close to the Father. He has brought him to light. So, I mean, it still works. Hmm. It's it's not as nice as the NIV, little, but he's... Yeah, it's a little clearer, but it's yeah, not... But he's, um, yeah, he's still basically saying, like, Jesus has brought God into the light. Like, you haven't seen God... Jesus brought God into the light. This is what God is like. So it's still getting at that point, but it, it feels clunky. The NIV, the NIV beat N.T. Wright. Just don't tell <laughs> Just don't tell N.T. Wright that I said Never. that. <laughs> he, uh, he's just, he just seems like the most eloquent like dude. Uh, I love uh, listening to him talk about Jesus. It is, it's so fun. Oh, it's so brilliant. Like he, so I was introduced to him in, uh, when I was in college, I went to a, a school called Messiah College, small private Christian school here in, or actually it's in Pennsylvania. And the first like real theology book I ever read was an N.T. Wright book. And before we read it, uh, the, our professor put on like a video of N.T. Wright talking about his book, da da da. And so then after that, I always have read N.T. Wright books in his like nice, <laughs> eloquent British <laughs> accent. <laughs> So I, I'm a huge fan. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, he's, he's like an unskippable devotional video on the Bible apps, uh, de- story of the day, like, uh, verse of the day. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of folks that they put on, on that particular, you know, you'll get your passage, uh, uh, or a little kind of like an intro and then you get your passage and then you get a little video devotional of someone kind of explaining the passage. And sometimes the people that they, that they bring on while very enthusiastic and, um, you know, beautiful in their own way, uh, just don't really speak to me. But um, N.T. Wright, whenever I see him sitting in his study, in his, you know, in front of his desk with books spread out all in front yeah, of him. Yeah, everywhere. Like, Stop. <laughs> Listen to this guy. Right, right. And his his accent just makes him sound like a hundred times more smart. <laughs> Smarter than, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. And he's a super nice dude. Like I've had the privilege of meeting him and he's very humble, very down to earth. Like it's pretty cool. And he has like, and a cool accent. So (laughs) worth the time. Well, NT right. If you're listening, you're welcome on the podcast. Oh my goodness. That would be so cool. (laughs) And this is, this is NT rights. Like uh, a guilty pleasure is that like at night he goes out for a stroll and listens to trans regret Snoopy presents the Bible. (laughs) Oh, if only. If that would be so cool. I'm, I'm going to believe that that's what happens just because I want to. So. <laughs> uh, well, I think we hit it. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on in any of these passages? No, that I mean, that was a lot of fun. Like, yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, like I, I'm in a place where like I'm still trying to figure out what exactly to do with the Bible, if that makes sense. 
Um, I used, so I used to read it every day. Um, and I'm not opposed to reading it, but I haven't just sat down to read the Bible in quite some time. Mostly just, um, now I've, I've used it for like, oh, I'm writing in this academic piece or I'm going to do this thing. So I'll read these, these bits. Um, but I think this is the most fun that I like genuinely most fun I've had engaging scripture in a very, very long time. And so I'm just very excited <laughs> that you. I had the opportunity to talk to you uh, <laughs> and do this because so it's, it's been awesome. I like so much fun. I would do this all the time. If reading the Bible was always as fun, I feel like a lot more people would do it. <laughs> it's up to us. We have to make it fun. Yes, we have to. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you were um, incredible to talk to. This was really, really great. So, um, you know, thank you so much. Uh, before we sign off, do you have anything that you want to to plug? I, I I love your podcast, by the way. It's oh, great. I didn't say you. that earlier, but it's great. Um, so why don't you tell everybody like where they can find it? Oh, sure. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so the podcast is called Rethinking Faith, and you can find us pretty much wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Um, we don't have a website, but... If you look up Podbean slash Rethinking Faith or, you know, Podbean dot Rethinking Faith, something like that, it'll bring up our page. Uh, but you can find us on Spotify, you know, Apple Podcast, Podbean, Google Play Store, whatever. We're there. Um, just look for us. And, yeah, if you want to come hang out and check out our show, uh, that would be awesome. We have a lot of fun there, too. Marty, my co-host, is a, a really cool dude. Um him and I differ theologically, which I think makes it a lot of fun. Uh, but we're also best friends, so we don't let that get in the way of of you know our friendship. So um, it's a good time, and and we would love if you would come and hang out with us sometime as well. So oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, we'll we'll put that together because I look forward to that. Yeah, sounds <laughs> like a plan. We're excited. This week's poem is by William Blake from his collection, Songs of Innocence. It's called The Divine Image. To mercy, pity, peace, and love, all pray in their distress, and to these virtues of delight return their thankfulness. For mercy, pity, peace, and love is God, our Father dear, and mercy, pity, peace, and love is man, his child, and care. For mercy has a human heart pity a human face, and love the human form divine, and peace the human dress. Then every man of every clime that prays in his distress, prays to the human form divine, love, mercy, pity, peace, and all must love the human form, in heathen, Turk, or Jew, when mercy, love, and pity dwell, their God is dwelling too. Thanks, everybody. When shadows take your hand And mist is on 